So I, I so we did a good job of engaging you all through some, through some questions, a little discussion. I think I want to do the same thing to start out here. Um, so first of all, let's, let's just ask you a question here. Has anybody seen windbreaks, buffers, fence rows, other things like that, bulldoze, other features of the landscape bulldozed off? Why do they bulldoze those off? Because you got to put a pivot up. Do what? You got to put a pivot up. You got to put a pivot out? Yeah, we're even dozing riparian buffers. You're dozing You're riparian, riparian buffers. I, that's why I include buffers. I've heard riparian buffers are being pushed back as well. You can gain an acre of farmland cheaper by bulldozing it than buying new land. Mm -hmm. yep. So it's a, it's a dollars and cents. They make more money, yes? My personal favorite is my agronomist promises me that there is going to be a genetic variety of corn, soybean, or alfalfa that will grow in that soil someday. So I'm getting uh, ready. <laughs> so I have heard that. The the new best one I heard was it interferes with the GPS signal that steers the tractor. Wow. Well, that's pretty important too, though. I mean, you hate to put your tractor down in the riparian. Yeah. Uh, evidently, what you're using a satellite that's at a low angle. Uh, at certain certain satellites, uh, if you're next to the trees, it'll interfere with the signal. Because auto steer is made us stupid. All right, so we well, can't drive a tractor straight. The one, the one that adds to that was it knocks the, not, it tries to, or the, the trees are knocking the antenna off. Knocking the, the antenna off, right. Oh. Can't watch the game. And my personal, <laughs> another one of my favorites, <laughs> another one of my favorites is we have pheasants in Nebraska. And I've had guys tell me, well, I was told that we have to get rid of all of our trees so that we don't have any hawks or anything to kill the pheasants, which is partially true. <laughs> you can thank the wildlife biologist in Nebraska for that comment. And also- A lot in Kansas, they just shoot the hawks. <laughs> and also that, and also that <laughs> pheasants are, do not go anywhere near trees, which is really <laughs> hog pooey because <laughs> a few years ago we had a horrible winter and guess where all the pheasants were? Right. So. We've all seen loss of some agroforestry practices and some trees on the landscape to enhance economic returns to the farm, or, and that's the perception anyway. Even, or, and, and maybe they're still hoping for that variety that will grow best on that soil. Now, I'm going to pick on Dan Shepard a little bit, even though he's not here. You all will see him this afternoon. I like Dan, okay? So don't, I like Dan. So he's a, he's a good guy. I think you heard him several times yesterday, so I'm, just, I'm using him to make a point here, right? So you heard him several times yesterday say, if it doesn't make me money, what? It's out of here, right? He's got some land that's getting ready to come out of CRP. He also mentioned that too, right? He's going to put that in something productive. And that's not necessary. And his pecan orchard may be a good productive system that, that's fine for the landscape too, but, but Dan's emphasis was if it doesn't make me money, it's out of here. Now, did you all hear him value anything else yesterday and he didn't mention anything about money? His wife. Perception. Percep yeah. no. Perception, he does like perception. You're absolutely right about that, very important. It was the... Um What's he, gonna do where he, what's, he, yeah, what's he gonna do where he had his heart nuts that weren't making him money? He's gonna plant sunflowers, sunflowers out there. So he's, he's done that for several years. Does. Why does he doves. plant sunflowers? Wildlife doves. 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 Yeah. But he didn't mention anything about money there. Uh, unless he Dove leases hunting. it for Unless he leases it. But but he likes to dove hunt. And I think it's so so my point here is even with those folks who you might think all they do out on their landscape is for the economic return, for the bottom dollar, how much money can I make off my every inch, square inch of my farm. There's always something that they value and treasure more than economics, whether it's perception or whether it's something that, that really gets them excited, like dove hunting every fall. The, so now let me ask you another question. Is there an, an agroforestry practice called wildlife? What? No. So you all are certainly the exception in your perspective fields. In, in that you have, you're, you're here today, you're exercising the ability to think outside the box, right? 
Wildlife is no exception there. We're thinking outside the box with wildlife. There is no wildlife practice in agroforestry. All agroforestry practices have the potential to benefit wildlife. It's how we design them that, that is what makes them attractive to a certain wildlife. So uh, we're going to go through this pretty quickly here. But because I too have more slides than I should in my talk, right? So, but we understand that carrying capacity is how many wildlife we can have out there on the landscape. There's some factors that limit that, whether it's manipulation of different plant successions, meeting these limiting factors, such whether nesting, food, water, cover, that animals and need, wildlife need during different times of the year. Plant succession. You know, when we talk agroforestry, we also do not want to be pigeonholed in through definitions necessarily, especially those through government regulations that say you plant this, and then it's hands off. Now, EQIP and other, other government practices have gotten much better about allowing us to manage these practices, but early on they were not so, right? But agroforestry is intensive, integrated, it's about the practice and a managed practice, the renewal of plant succession is very reasonable and very possible within an agroforestry practice. So we're going to hop through a lot of this stuff. Food cover, water, but a key here is identifying the species that we're trying to, trying to attract. If it's Dan Shepard and I can tell him a way to get more doves to the property, if it's uh, the Duck Dynasty folks, the duck hunters out there that I can tell them how to attract more waterfowl to their landscape. If we can manage that in a productive system, so much the better, right? If I can tell Dan he can have his doves and get rich too, he'll probably put 3,000 acres of it out there, right? So, but identify the species we're talking about. Recognize that for each of the species, there are different habitat needs. One of the key factors, in, and I'm speaking in a lot of generalities here, because there's not one size fits all for any of the wildlife species, but we understand that mobility is a big factor with how many acres do you need if you're going to do, uh, anybody heard of cute quality deer management? How many acres do you need? But a lot. Yeah, you need, you need large expanse of land to do quality deer management, to manage the population, the, uh, the, the balance between your does and your bucks. And all. all right, so one of the generalities that I would put forth to you is manage for a, a least common denominator. If I manage for quail, quail does not have the mobility that turkey and deer do. Turkey and deer may cover anywhere than three to 500 acres of land. Quail, we're you know, 40 acres maybe. So if I manage for quail habitat on certain areas of my farm, deer and turkey will use that land too. Rabbits will use that land too. If I manage just for deer habitat, I may or may not have quail habitat out there on the property. So um, some design principles, food sources, we're just going to blaze through these but focus on native plants. I love to integrate natives on the landscape. I think they attract a different uh, insect population. They, there's just a lot of benefits to natives, including the deeper rooted structure, probably the impact on the soil horizon, infiltration of nutrients and water. But again, for, let's, let's, let's not just integrate natives without some plan for managing those, right? Because we know that in buffers, you've gotta, you've gotta remove some some vegetative material to keep it invigorated and growing and active on your landscape. Um, diversity on the landscape is something I think agroforestry offers. Uh, I guess an important one, recognizing the, the utility of our agroforestry practices year round for wildlife. Um, maybe it's just having the trees out there for winter cover that's, that's extremely important and how to position those on the landscape then as well so that they're accessible to your wildlife populations, adjacent to food for your wildlife populations. Um, and I tend to focus 
I, I'm a hunter too, so I tend to like to focus from a, a hunter's perspective and the utility of wildlife species. But that's not the only reason people like wildlife. Now some see it as a nuisance, but there's also big lease hunting opportunities. There are also opportunities for people that just enjoy watching wildlife, bird viewing, the, uh, the agritourism and wildlife. I've designed some, uh, some quail planting ideas for people because all they wanted to do was to come out and see some quail, come out and hear quail whistling. No, they were not interested in hunting at all, right? But they want, the, they want to do something to try to attract that wildlife to, to sustain that wildlife population. So um, there's other th reasons besides hunting to attract wildlife. Agroforestry offers us the opportunity to develop structure on the landscape that in an agricultural world may not be there. Um, of course, we can incorporate various buffer widths uh, to also be then create a, a, a sound riparian buffer that's more attractive to wildlife species. Travel corridors, connectivity of landscapes, they may be, that may be a negative if we're talking about deer as a nuisance. But again, I think it's a balancing act in terms of what the landowner wants on their land. Um, in our prescriptions for landowners, we need to include timing of activities as well. Mowing is a biggie. Um, so, consider landowner objectives, timing of disturbances, local climate, and how uh, disturbance affects other resource objectives on the property as well. Agroforestry then I think provides us an exceptional means to balance productivity and the conservation of limited resources, water, air, soil. Agroforestry is stewardship of our resources. You know, there's, there's plenty of practices out there that all they do is conserve without allowing someone to produce. And we're seeing some of the ramifications of our of early CRP that did that in the, practice, the grounds coming out of those uh, CRP practices because of the price of corn and beans. I think they'd be less likely to if all the while the practice had implemented conservation that also allowed productivity for the or economic returns for the for the landowner. And again, I realize you know this that's somewhat talking to the preaching to the choir, right? You all know a lot of this already, and um, let's take a look at alley cropping then. Um, better than a monocrop, but other ways to enhance the way we do our alley cropping through, you notice in this previous picture, it's nice and clean underneath there, right? If the, I hate to use the term product again, but if the product or the crop we're, we're managing for is in fact wildlife, then incorporate shrubs and other lower growing species. And I say alley cropping or windbreak because the differences can become subtle, and, but they're real in our, in our on paper definitions, right? But let's not become too constrained by the definition we see on paper for any one of our, of our agroforestry practices either. And you'll notice too that this one it does produce linear edges, but, but the field curves and, and moves a little bit, right? So it's not just straight line necessarily. And we can follow topography with, with the way we implement our practices. Um, also, can we incorporate species of shrubs and other things that will benefit wildlife? And when we go see Terry Durham and his elderberry, don't think that just because we plant it again that, that we can't manage succession. Terry cuts his elderberry off every year to help limit disease and other things, right? So we can, there are ways that we can implement these on the landscape, manipulate them to benefit wildlife, and at the same time have productivity from those plantings too. So the civil pasture practice then, um, one of the, I, I guess, you know, my civil pasture work was done 
from a research perspective, so we hedged on trying to su successfully do research out there. One of my big regrets, I guess I would say, is that I wish we had included warm season grasses out there. Because I think when we're talking about the use of shade to mitigate heat stress on animals, summer's the best time to put your livestock in there then, right? And I wish we were growing a grass that was, we planted fescue. What does fescue do over the summer? It goes in a little slump period. It kind of shuts down and, and doesn't do that as much under the shade. But, but nonetheless, your warm season grasses, the native grasses would have been better for wildlife. And I think it would have made a, a nice contrast to all the fescue we have out in our open pastures to be able to put them up on warm season grasses under shade over the summer. So, um, and those same grasses then provide some nice roosting habitat and nesting habitat, everything from turkey to, uh, to quail. So, incorporating legumes for the insects that they attract as well as their benefit to livestock, right? The nitrogen that they provide is good. The riparian forest buffer, um, Of course, I love the zones because they provide some diversity of plants on the landscape, and both in height and what they provide to animals. But duck hunters love to seasonally flood, right, to attract wildlife. Have you seen them seasonally flood cropland? They do in, in Missouri anyway. They, they, they initiate the flooding. Over along the Mississippi, one of the places that I really liked they used a rice plow to berm up the land to create. How deep do you need water for ducks? I see people shaking their heads. Not very deep, right? The shallow water is probably better. It gives them access to the food. So they raise these, they use this rice plow to raise these beds up that are just knee high. Then they plant, they planted pin oaks and other acorn producing trees down those, those, uh, those berms. In between their berms, they were growing crops. They weren't going to harvest all the crops. In fact, what their, their plans were to intentionally then each fall to pump water in there and flood those areas between their trees and duck hunt there. Big lease opportunities for, the, for that landowner. So um, I think we can recognize that agroforestry with wildlife as a, as a product, that we can, we can manage wetlands, incorporating trees, crops, in certain environments through seasonal flooding then um, produce better wildlife habitat. Forest farming, I like this picture because it shows the succession of the forest from newly harvested rabbit populations out there. Um, that's a little uh, timber doodle, woodcock, right over here, right? So when it's a, a thick dog-haired mess of ni nice new young trees coming in there 10 to 20 years, you get great habitat for some of your birds. 20 to 30 years, you got deer in there. 40 to 50 years, that's a little grouse picture right there, which of course I think of grouse kind of across new, they like a mix of new and old material. 60 to 70 years, wild turkey, raccoons up here. Um, at 80 years, when you're then ready to kind of reinitiate the cycle. Incorporating understanding how different wildlife species use the different successional stages of your forest development into your forest farming, whether that's using group openings and producing something in those openings for a, for a while, and then as the forest develops, um, transitioning back into the forested area and moving your group opening someplace else in the woods. I think we have to use what we know about the benefits of thinning, management of the forest, but branch out to looking at how we can produce a crop and how that impacts wildlife. So just a real quick summary then. Identify the wildlife species of interest. Pick the species that perhaps has the smallest range of all of your suite of, animal, of wildlife species that you're interested in and manage for that habitat that's, that's more constraining on the landscape. Recognizing limiting factors, whether that's nesting, food, water, what is it you need to create on the landscape to attract that wildlife, and then manipulate the habitat to maximum benefits. Balancing production and conservation 
as we exercise stewardship on the land. So, could you talk about pollinators a little bit, or because that's a, I guess it's a pretty big issue. That's kind of a hot topic, isn't it? Yeah. And I think uh, so. What do the what do, what do the pollinators need? Well, they need food all year long, so that's providing a range of stuff. So they have it in the early spring, through the summer, even into the fall. And the trees are actually some of the early stuff that they use real early in the season. Right. And I so, admittedly, I don't. I've raised some honeybees, but you're probably you're talking about more like the bumblebees and things. Yeah, and, um, we need them all. Uh, Xerxes Society has got a lot of good stuff, yeah. and we worked with them, and they developed uh, four technical notes for us, and. One of the things I heard, saw that was really very common was uh, bare soil. And they said, you know, just a mound of bare soil and uh, areas that aren't tilled regularly and aren't mm. completely vegetated with grass uh, so is a great area for a number of the native species, as well as the, the, the season-long foraging. Uh, and so we can do that. Well, I know on the NRCS guidelines when we were developing pollinator habitats, you had to have a mix of really early, early, mid, late, and really late flower stage. And the seeding rates on those things, where you were talking yesterday, you know, 30, really high PLS on that, that's low. I mean, they want a lot of bare soil, really open. You don't want hardly any native grasses. You want low stuff and a great mix of flowers, forbs, legumes, and shrubs is really what they push on a lot of that stuff. And it seems to work fantastic. There's a researcher in Delaware, Doug Tallamy, that did a research report on the top 20 tree species for Lepidopteras, and that's really interesting. Oaks are right up there. Oaks are number one. Yeah. yeah. So we've been pushing that pretty hard really. So I think it can be done. It has to be done intentionally. I've had, I would say, place a strong emphasis on the forbs, too. And, uh, you know, it, it seems to be no problem to get grasses to come in. You plant a mix of forbs, you probably have some grass seed in there by mistake yeah. as well. Most of the native mixes have a little bit of whatnot in yeah. them. Some stuff you didn't order necessarily. Is that blue whatnot or is that yellow whatnot? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, but I, but I, because where I've incorporated grass and forbs, the grass, it, it's really easy for that grass to take over the site. Well, I know on all the pollinator sites I have, you know, most of them are just generally an acre, and it's about one acre of pollinator for every 20 of native grass. Is we tr set back the native grass, either by light disking or till it or something like that, seed directly into it, and it's usually three to four years, you're back out there tilling it again and reseeding the forbs so the grass has come right back. Yeah. Even though you have no grass in the mix, it comes from the edge and just comes right back in and in a hurry. And so your pollinator acre only lasts for about three to five years, depending on how good a grass stand you have. Now this is Nebraska. I mean, it's a very, a little state to stay, but that's what I've noticed over the years. It's they only last about three to five years. Then you're back in seeding it again to get the pollinator stuff back. Can you graze it? No, none of this is grazed. How about fire? Do you apply fire? Fire works really good, but what it does is it makes the grass establish faster. Because <laughs> when you burn, when you do the early spring burns, it seems that the grass really responds to that and they'll fill in the pollinator habitat even a year or two faster. It makes the grass look great, but... Yeah. <laughs> what about fall burn? Yeah. Fall burn? You know, I don't have an experiment. That's, that's the tendency is the fall burns to promote, promote it better. Mm -hmm. I'll say that's, that's what we want to try next. Set grass back. Mm -hmm. But we honestly, I haven't experienced, haven't experienced it with yet. It would be an easy assessment. Yeah, it would be not easy. That's so, on the to-do list. So how would you do a fall burn for like the wildlife? Um, is there any constraints there? Or just no, up? mostly I think the burning. Oh, you mean for leaving habitat through the winter? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just You can do a portion of that, <laughs> but these are all the yeah. one acre sites, so yeah. the yeah. raw alternators aren't utilized. Yeah, it wouldn't be expensive burns. If oh, I say you want to do patch burning, you wouldn't want to do large expansion that yeah, something like that. Oh, just that just that's and that's what you want to do in the spring too. You don't want to if you've got a hundred acres you don't want to burn all hundred acres of it, right? You want to chop it up. And again it's so you maximize the the benefit from micro disturbance across that site. So well so you got those pollinator publications online? Yeah they're on our all website. Right. Uh, there there are four uh, agroforestry notes that were developed uh, one talks about using uh, 
I can force a practice as a buffer to uh, filter out herbicide, well, pesticides, and then uh, other ways to manage for pollinators. But they were, the Xerxes folks wrote them for us. Xerxes folks also wrote a book, How yeah. to Promote Pollinators. Yeah. Yeah. It's, really it's like a $30 book. It is fantastic. It's really good. Sarah also has a pollinator yeah. book out. And the whole th that one, the whole thing is on the web. So you can go to sarah.org and look under their learning center. Thank you, Dusty. Thank you.